Well, a famous evangelist told the following incident. I have a friend who, in a time of business recession, lost his job, a sizable fortune, and his beautiful home. To add to his sorrow, his precious wife died, yet he tenaciously held to his faith, the only thing he had left. One day, when he was out walking in search of employment, he stopped to watch some men who were doing stonework on a large church. One of them was chiseling a triangular piece of rock. Where are you going to put that? He asked. And the workman said, do you see that little opening up there near the spire? Well, I'm shaping this stone down here so that it will fit up there. Tears filled my friend's eyes as he walked away, for the Lord had spoken to him through that laborer whose words gave new meaning to his troubled situation. You see, friends, Jesus told his disciples that in this world you will have trouble, but take comfort. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. We need to understand that suffering and loss, friends, are a part of this existence. But it's a temporary existence. It's temporary. Remember, the, the Sermon on the Mount is not this pie-in-the-sky, uh, ideal, perfect situation. It is a blueprint for our lives. It's a blueprint for you and I in the way that we are to live out our faith. And so our goal today is to realize that Jesus is teaching his disciples how to, how to live as believers in earshot of folks that may be in preparatory sanctification. And so how we respond to our circumstances may be a tipping point for some who are observing us and how we respond to circumstances of life. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. As we continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew, we're in a series, a mini-series inside another series, looking at the Beatitudes. And we're in chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. We're going to focus on verse 4 this morning in chapter 5 of Matthew. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And of course, we're going to focus on that chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Just to give us some context, of course, the Gospel of Matthew is written to Israel in order to demonstrate to Israel that Jesus Christ is, in fact, their promised Messiah. And Matthew regularly goes back to the Old Testament and references prophecies that point to Messiah and then demonstrate that Jesus has fulfilled all of those prophecies in the way that he lived his life and in his death and burial and resurrection and ascension. Chapters 5 through 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we are right now. And that's also known as the Kingdom Life Discourse. It, it unpacks for you and I uh, what it means as Jesus' disciples to live out a radical kingdom life in our everyday world. And so it's the kingdom life discourse, or you and I are kingdom life disciples. As we get to chapter 10, over the next several months, the second discourse there is this mission mandate, which describes how we as Jesus' disciples are to go out and live out the message of the gospel of the kingdom of God in a hostile world. So we are also mission-driven disciples. Chapter 13, the third discourse, is a collection of parables which reveals really what it means for Jesus' disciples to live as kingdom subjects in a world not yet fully expressing God's power. And so we are also disciples in a secret kingdom. Chapter 18, the fourth discourse, is uh, the community prescription focusing on discipleship to Jesus' followers that demonstrate through uh, the church and the way that we live out our humility, our purity, our accountability, our forgiveness and reconciliation. So we're community-based 
disciples. And of course, chapters 24 and 25 is the fifth discourse, and that's really the end times. It discusses the end times, and uh, for you and I, it's called the Olivet Discourse, and that concludes Jesus' teaching on discipleship by describing as, how we, as disciples, are to live out each day in expected preparation for His return with power. And so you and I are expectant sojourners in a strange and foreign land. And so perhaps from time to time people look at you and see your response to circumstances. They see how you live out your life and they may look at you and say, you're kind of strange. You know, from, for, for some folks, they may look at that situation and say, well, gee, that's an, that's an insult. But if someone says that to me, friends, I take that as a great compliment. Because you see, you and I are different. We're sojourners in this world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And people should look at us and say, there's something different about you. And I want it. And I want it. So today we're looking at ourselves as kingdom life disciples. And just back to verse 4 there. I'll, I'll read verse 4 again because I want to I key on that verse. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, it's, it's no small coincidence, friends, that we are here this morning looking at this verse. I want you to remember uh, that uh, as your pastor... Uh, I do what's called a plan program of preaching. And a plan program of preaching is that I will look out and I will develop outlines m many months in advance. And the reason that I do that is, is there, there are a number of reasons that I do it. One of them is so that I surrender to the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit speak to us as He sees fit in our needs in the moment rather than me getting on some hobby horse and thinking, oh, well, I think the church needs this or I think the church needs that. But it's no small coincidence that this is the passage this morning, friends. And I want us to really, really focus on what this means in our hearts today. Well, how do, we, how do we give hope when there appears to be no hope? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation where you just looked around at circumstances of life and just thought, well, the situation's hopeless. It's hopeless. How do we deal with that? Well, the famous preacher D.L. Moody told about a Christian woman who was always bright, cheerful, and optimistic, even though she was confined to her room because of illness. She lived in an attic apartment on the fifth floor of an old run-down building. A friend decided to visit her one day and brought along another woman, a person of great wealth. Since there was no elevator, the two ladies began to climb the long upward. And when they reached the second floor, the well-to-do woman commented, What a dark and, and filthy place. Her friend replied, It's better higher up. When they arrived at the third landing, the remark was made, Things look even worse here. At which the friend replied, It's better higher up. The two women finally reached the attic level where they found the bedridden saint of God. A smile on her face radiated the joy that filled her heart. Although the room was clean and flowers were on the windowsill, the wealthy visitor could not get over the stark surroundings in which the woman lived. She blurted out, It must be very difficult for you to be here like this. Without hesitating, the woman smiled and said, It's better higher up. <laughs> better higher up. She was not looking at the temporal things of life, friends. With the eyes of faith fixed on the eternal, she had found the secret of true satisfaction and contentment because it's better higher up. We are just passing through this world, friends. Sojourners in a strange and foreign land. This is not our home. This is not our home. Our home is in heaven. Well, how do we, how do we deal with, with devastating loss? How do we deal with that? How do, we, how do we comfort someone who has experienced loss? How do we do that? Well, a, a miserable looking woman recognized F.B. Meyer on the train and ventured to share her burden with him. For years, she had cared for a crippled daughter who brought great joy to her life. 
She made tea for her each morning and then left for work, knowing that in the evening the daughter would be there when she arrived home. But the daughter had died. And the grieving mother was alone and miserable. Home was not home anymore. Meyer gave her wise counsel. He said, when you get home and you put the key in the door, he said, say aloud, Jesus, I know you are here. And be ready to greet him directly when you open the door. And as you light the fire, tell him what happened during the day. If anybody has been kind, tell him. If anybody has been unkind, tell him, just as you would have told your daughter. At night, stretch out your hand in the darkness and say, Jesus, I know you're here. I know you're here. Some months later, Meyer was back in that neighborhood and he met the woman again. But he didn't recognize her at all. Her face radiated joy instead of announcing misery. I did as you told me, she said, and it has made all the difference in my life. And now I feel I know him. You know, perhaps you've heard that, that, that phrase, he's so heavenly minded, he can be no earthly good. Well, let me challenge you to this, friends. I disagree with that. I believe, friends, that we must be heavenly minded in order to be earthly good. When we're light in a dark place, when we react that way instead of this way, and people go, wow, how can you react like that? to that. And we get the opportunity to say, well, let me tell you what the Lord did for me, what my Savior did for me, and the suffering that He endured for me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. <coughs> Praise God for what He has done. We must be heavenly minded, or we can be no earthly good at all, friends. But just a review. Jesus sees the crowds and he proceeds up the mountain. And as he sits down, he calls his disciples to himself. And if you recall, as we discussed this last week, this is a form of teaching that rabbis would use in order to demonstrate to their disciples that it's time to have a lesson. It's time to learn something. And so the Sermon on the Mount is a teaching lesson. It's a, a, a kingdom life discourse that teaches the disciples how to live out their faith. And so he begins to teach them while the crowds observe. Interestingly, there are disciples that are there, and then there's a crowd that's on looking. Make no mistake, friends. You and I, as disciples of Jesus, always have a crowd on looking, whether we know it or not. Whether we recognize it or not, we do. And so the first thing that he says is that blessed are the poor in spirit. And last week we recognized that what that means is that we just as believers recognize that in and of ourselves, we are incapable, incapable of earning our way into the grace of God. And by the grace of God, therefore, we go. And so he says the reason that they are blessed is the kingdom of heaven is theirs. In other words, it's identifying the heart of a believer as someone who recognizes the poorness of our spirit. Today, he continues saying that those who mourn will be comforted. Well, how will this be? How will this be? Well, here's our takeaway today, friends. It's another story. Once during Queen Victoria's reign, she heard that the wife of a common laborer had lost her baby. Having experienced deep sorrow herself, she felt moved to express her sympathy, and so she called on the bereaved woman one day and spent some time with her. After she left, the neighbors asked what the queen had said. Nothing, replied the woman. Nothing. She simply put her hands on mine, and we silently wept together. Perhaps we're the kind of person that doesn't really know what to say. You know, and as, as, as I reflect on myself, it, it, at, at times of, of loss, I, I do find it very difficult to, to say, do I say something? Do I not say something? Will it remind them? You know, will, if I don't say something, will they, will they say, well, he didn't even say anything? You know, but maybe sometimes, friends, it just doesn't matter if we say something as long as people know that we're there. 
and that we care. Just being there for someone and holding their hand sometimes can be enough. Just be there to offer comfort and let them recognize you love them. So here's my challenge. During our daily quiet time, if you will, meditate on verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Perhaps that's you. Perhaps that's you to be comforted. Perhaps that's you to comfort. Remember this. Empathy is your pain in my heart. That person's pain in your heart. Feel what they feel. What they're going through. Love them. <clears throat> Take time this week to weep with those who weep and comfort those who are hurting. Let's be the body of Christ and do that. Let's pray.